The right way to deal with your neuroticism is to increase your conscientiousness because we also know that the higher your conscientiousness, the lower your neuroticism. Conscientiousness does seem to keep neuroticism in check. And so I would say, and have said this to many people, um, clean your room, organize your life, like get a routine, get up every day at the same time, go to bed at the same time, establish disciplined habits. And that will help a lot. A schedule. Like, and here's how to use a schedule. Use a, use a calendar. Use Google Calendar. But don't use it as a tyrant. You know, you want to use, your, use a calendar as if it's your, um, your confidant and advisor. And what you want to do is use the calendar. Sit down and open the calendar and think, okay, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to design a week of days that I would really like to have. So what that would mean then is that you would schedule things that you would consider meaningful and productive, you know, on a daily basis so that you feel that your life is justified by having a day like that and also to schedule enough of your responsibilities so that you make progress day by day instead of falling farther behind. And what that'll do is it doesn't directly affect your neurophysiology, but you know, you're reacting as a neurotic person, a person high in neuroticism, say, you react to uncertainty and the unexpected with more physiological preparedness and more expenditure of energy than the typical person. And so what you want to do is organize your surroundings because it's a lot easier to organize your surroundings, at least to begin with, than it is to do radical reconstruction on your fundamental temperament, which you might not be able to do at all. So I would say discipline, discipline. And the other thing I would say for creative people, and this is true for people in general, but it's really important for creative people, is that if you want to be creative, which is very, very dangerous and very, very um, unlikely to succeed, although absolutely necessary if you happen to be high in openness, is that you should organize the rest of your life, except for your creative endeavors, in a pretty traditional and conservative manner, if you can do that. because. What that does is buttress you against the unexpected and give you some stability on many, you know, along many of the potential dimensions of your life. And that frees you up to take larger risks in the creative domain. Now, it's hard for creative people to do that because they're sort of blasting out, you know, laterally in all directions simultaneously. But you exhaust yourself that way and you also risk scattering yourself um, Louis Watterson here had, had a question. How would you suggest someone who's a jack of all trades and master of none conduct themselves? Well, you're probably high in openness, high in creativity. And one of the dangers of being high in creativity, especially if you're also high in neuroticism, is that it's hard for creative people to catalyze an identity because they're basically Pan-like, you know, like Peter Pan or like, or like Pan, which means everything. The god of the forest is the god of everything to some degree. And the problem with being everything is that you're also nothing at the same time because you never specialize. And so I would say that if you're, I, I think that being a jack of all trades is pretty damn useful, but I would also say that it's really necessary to buckle down and find one primary mode of discipline. And Jack or Louis, if you can't figure out what you should do, then guess, just pick something that you think that you could hit hard and concentrate on. You don't have to be perfect at it. You don't even have to get it right. But pick something rather than nothing or pick something rather than all things. And then set yourself to master that because, you know, you need to have a, uh, um, a discipline, a primary discipline. It's absolutely necessary to succeed in life. Now, once you have a primary discipline, then you can branch out and, and become a multiplicity in your disciplined approach and then you're absolutely bloody unstoppable but you really need that initial disciplinary routine you know this is something Nietzsche knew uh, knew very well um, he said for example I just wrote about this today that um, it was the long unfreedom of the of Europe's subjugation to the dogmatic structures of the Catholic Church that ennobled the European mind and gave it the capacity to widely range that it eventually developed. But it was that initial subjugation, that initial voluntary slavery that produced the discipline that produced the spirit that could then go out and do other things. And, and it's really, really useful to subjugate yourself something to something voluntarily. You know, I think that's partly why it's useful to practice a religious faith um, because you subject yourself to a disciplinary structure that way. And you might think, well, that's all oppressive and all of that. And of course, that's true. But it also makes you disciplined. And once you're disciplined, like you're you're like a sharpened sword, man, like a well-tempered blade. And then you can go out there and operate in the world. 
So, and if you haven't found your passion, then I would say, well, don't wait around till you find the damn thing because you may never find it, is pick something and focus on it, you know, and if you move strongly and forthrightly towards it for a number of months at least or even a number of years and then you find well that wasn't the thing for you it isn't going to be a waste anyways because most of the time the pursuit of any disciplined knowledge pays off even if it doesn't pay off in the way that you initially expect